introduction uh, right before you present. So Timmy will be introducing you. Once Timmy is done introducing you, um, you will be able to share your screen. So um, he's right before you, you begin. Michelle, you want me to start letting people in? Uh, yeah, we're about time. Thank you, Courtney. Welcome, everyone. This is our last session of Blue. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today in our fourth and final session for this year's Future Leaders and Planning Program. Thank you all for joining us these past four weeks. It has truly been a pleasure learning with you all and having an opportunity to hear from our guest speakers. So today's session will cover a range of topics that uh, focus on disparities in urban planning. This will be our first ever collaboration with the Atlanta Regional Commission so I'd like to give a special welcome to our peers from Atlanta today. Welcome, welcome. Uh, so typically we announce a prize winner at the beginning of the session, but in the interest of time, we will announce our two winners at the very end of today's session. And so I, I will start off with the agenda for today. So uh, we'll start off with an introduction to urban inequities. Um, that introduction will be given by Timmy Coyejo, who will provide us with an intro to inequitable lending practices from a historical lens. Uh, we've already started off with our session welcome, so then we'll move on to that introduction by Timmy. And then we'll have um, Tanika Johnson from the Folded Map Project to speak about present inequities concerning residential segregation in Chicago. Uh, following Tanika's presentation, uh, our third session will focus, our third section, excuse me, will focus on a, a panel discussion moderated by Brittany Palmer. Uh, from the Atlanta Regional Commission. This uh, panel discussion will focus on the future of urban planning from an equity lens, followed by a question and answer period. We'll then end with a small group discussion, which will be led by Matt Stern, and then we'll close out for the day. So moving on to our next slide, which is today's presenters. Uh, we are very excited to have uh, presenters from both Chicago and Atlanta. So Timmy Coyejo and Matt Stern, our, uh, our session leaders from um, CMAP, Brittany Palmer from the Atlanta Regional Commission um, will also be presenting with us today. And then we're also very pleased to welcome Tamika Johnson from the Folded Map Project. And so quickly, um, as I mentioned earlier today, uh, we are, are collaborating with the Atlanta Regional Commission today. So I'd like to first start off with a, a poll to get a better understanding of our student representation today. So uh, please, if you don't mind, uh, launch our first polling question, which asks you, where are you joining us from today? In addition, um, because this is our fourth and final session, we want to give you all enough time to ask questions. So if we're able to extend the session by 15 minutes today, uh, we're curious to know if you'd be able to participate. So please answer the second polling question as well. All right, I'm gonna give um, folks about another 10 seconds. All right, great. So we have about 72% of our participants today from the Chicago region. We have 25% from Atlanta, another 3% from out of um, the state. Um, regarding today's question, um, in extension of today's session, it seems that most people would be able to participate. So we're at 69%. So we will be able to extend today's session by 15 minutes. 
and we look forward to having um, the conversation with you all. So um, I would like to now hand it over to my colleague, Brittany Palmer, to give us an introduction about today's collaboration. Hi, everybody. Uh, I just want to share with you a little bit about um, both of the agencies that are collaborating today. Planning agencies are responsible for addressing a wide range of issues, including transportation, water and natural sustainability, promoting affordable housing and more. Planning agencies organize their priorities with strategic plans that span multiple years. The Atlanta Regional Commission Strategic Plan, Winning the Future, focuses on world-class infrastructure, which means a sustainable supply of clean water and a comprehensive transportation network, uh, healthy livable communities, which focus on helping to create and maintain um, vibrant, walkable communities, better housing, and quality of life for all of its members, and the competitive economy. Uh, thinking about an economy that is thriving and competitive uh, for improved um, opportunities for social and economic mobility. The Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning, or CMAP, strategic plan on to 2050 focuses on inclusive growth, um, growing the economy through opportunity for all, regardless of race, income, or background, resilience, which means preparing for rapid change, both known and unknown, um, including economic, fiscal, and environmental uncertainties, and prioritize investments, uh, meaning including a wise management of public funds for infrastructure development and the economy. Today, we'll explore ways that both regions address critical issues of inequities in past, present, um, plan, excuse me, past and present planning and work towards a more equitable future. I'm now going to turn it over to Timmy, who will speak more about today's learning objectives. Hi, Brittany. Hi, everyone. And thanks, Brittany, for that recap of the two agencies that we have in Atlanta and in Chicago. So for today, we're going to be covering both the history of redlining. Uh, we're going to connect the way that that history still impacts present day cities such as Chicago and Atlanta through Tanika's work and presentation as well as the panel. And then lastly, we'll have a period of interactive discussion among the participants where you'll be able to go into further detail to better understand the specific drivers of racial inequities today. Uh, so the next slide is going to be where we give a brief recap of some of the most infamous uh, governmental policies surrounding uh, racial discrimination in housing which is redlining. But before I get too far into it, we wanted to uh, put a short poll to the participants to see how familiar you are with the topic of redlining. Okay, so a few more seconds left. All right, um, let's see, the poll has now ended. So 76% of you said yes, you're familiar with redlining, which is uh, great, uh, where it came up in some of the pre-readings that we distributed, uh, specifically the Adam ruins everything video about the disturbing history of the suburbs, but um, I'm just going to give a brief recap of both redlining as well as uh, ways that present day investment and disinvestment are uh, offshoots of the legacy of redlining. So the Homeowners Loan Corporation, uh, the Homeowners Loan Corporation or the HOLC was a government agency created in the 1930s as a New Deal agency that was instituted in order to support homeowners and businesses that were devastated by the Great Depression. The HOLC was instrumental in standardizing loans as well as encouraging investment in residential markets as well as commercial real estate. 
uh, HOLC staff members were particularly involved in the creation of these maps that you see on the screen here. These maps were created by uh, using local real estate professionals in cities across the nation that uh, based off of assessments of the types of housing, the age of housing, and importantly, who lived there, uh, these different neighborhoods were given grades based off of how good a quote unquote uh, investment those communities might be. Neighborhoods that received the highest rating of an A uh, were colored in green, whereas neighborhoods that received the lowest rating were colored in red on the map, which uh, those, those neighborhoods were deemed hazardous and not good investments. On the next slide, you'll see a zoom in of some of these maps just to be able to see closer. Um, while, while that slide is changing, so here, as you can see, the cities were assigned different um, tracks and in the different tracks, based off of the characteristics of the neighborhoods, uh, there were um, varying uh, grades assigned, as I was just saying. And you can see the legend in the, in the top right-hand corner of the screen, which just kind of uh, shows you the types of aspects of the legend that these uh, government officials used. Um, specifically, as I, as I previewed, the racial and ethnic demographics of the neighborhood were a key determining factor as to whether an area was deemed worth being invested in or not. Uh, the HLC assumed that the residency of African Americans and immigrants uh, Eastern European immigrants predominantly, uh, as well as working class whites, reduced the value of homes and therefore made those areas more risky to extend loans to. These assumptions of whether a community was worth investing in ended up further uh, entrenching the lack of investment that these communities likely were already ex exhibiting. Um, the quote that we have on the screen on the screen is just one example that I'll read to of, of the types of assessments that were racist in their intention or in their background that led to this discrimination. Um, this quote uh, comes from a section of uh, Chicago, which was uh, close to downtown uh, to the west of it. Um, and I'll, I'll read the quote now. Uh, this is one of the poorest areas near downtown, population predominantly Italian. There is a market infiltration of Negro from the area on the south who, in turn, are driving Italians into the section on the north. Most properties are little better than minimum shelter, and rents here are about as low as it is possible to imagine. Section has no future. The conclusion that the section has no future by these appraisers at the HOLC, in fact, in some ways ensured that those sections would not have futures by denying them resources. Um, in the next slide, uh, you'll see uh, two photos of homes in Chicago in present day that were in the WEBZ news story that we assigned that went over the present day inequities between neighborhoods. Uh, home ownership uh, in the 20th century when a lot of this redlining I just covered happened is that was a key way for families to build wealth and for that to uh, extend across generations. And in present day America, we're still living with the history of those past discriminatory policies. For instance, looking at the uh, wealth of black versus white families. Uh, today, the typical white family has a wealth of $171,000, whereas a black family only has a net worth of $17,000. This is from 2016 data. So that's a 10 point, a 10 times difference. Um, and in the, in the WB story, we saw how those, uh, that, 
investment and, and lack of investment in, in black and brown communities uh, continues in, in a ways that are very similar, though not uh, legally the same, but in practice, very similar to the redlining that uh, we just talked about that happened in the, in the 40s in, in the country. And uh, it, it all uh, just is to show the way that there are still present day issues in terms of access to capital and resources in, in these communities. And uh, the work that Tanika is going to be presenting uh, shortly uh, really uh, is going to further demonstrate that, that to you all. So uh, I'm going to stop now with this recap. Uh, please feel free to go back to the resources that we had on the Flip Engagement website uh, in order to dig further into those topics. So uh, Nika Lewis Johnson is a photographer, visual artist, and a proud resident of Englewood on the south side of Chicago. Her artistic repertoire often explores urban segregation and documents the nuances and richness of the Black community. Her Englewood-based photography projects from the inside and everyday rituals were exhibited in Pilsen and other cultural centers across the city. Her exhibit, The Folded Map Project, which showed how neighborhoods uh, on opposite ends of the city had very different housing and other characteristics um, that were outshoots of this, these uh, institutional policies uh, garnered much media attention as well as acclaim. Uh, in addition to her artistic endeavors, Tanika also uh, is active in her community and co-founded the resident association of Greater Englewood or RAGE, whose mission is to mobilize people and resources to force positive change in Englewood through solution-based approaches. And now uh, I want to introduce and invite Tanika to present on her work. Hello, everyone. Um, can you hear me okay? Thumbs up? Perfect. Um, just excuse me, I'll be adjusting these headphones because they're too big for my ears. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now. Okay. Is that box in the way, Courtney? Perfect. Okay, so I'm just going to get right in, um, but I'm going to start with this introduction. I'm from Southside Chicago, Inglewood neighborhood. I'm sure the words you've heard to describe Inglewood include black, dangerous, poor, gun violence. However, Inglewood is where I grew up and still. Before I know you about the map, you live out in the neighborhood that you grew up in or where you live now. What influenced your decision? Who did you talk to? And while you're thinking about that, I'm gonna tell you how I came to live in Inglewood and how I created. So the question that I would like for you all to think about is how did you all come to live in the neighborhood that you live in now? Or the labor neighborhood that you grew up in? Um, are you familiar with your family's reasons for choosing that neighborhood? And who did they talk to? Or who did you talk to for making the decision? And I'm gonna to explain to you how I came to grow up and live in Inglewood. It's because of this woman here, Marilyn G. Tenney. She is my grandmother. She migrated from down south to Chicago on the tail end of the Great Migration. Um, the Great Migration was the mass exodus of African Americans from down south to northern cities, really the northern cities. And my grandmother came to Chicago in search of better opportunities like most African-Americans because of the discrimination they were experiencing. 
And she was also an artist, but being a black woman interested in the arts in the 1960s was not a viable uh, living. So she wanted to come to Chicago and get what old black folks call a good government job. So she was offered a job as an administrative assistant at the local social security office. And she saved her money for seven years working that job to purchase the building that I would grow up in. And the building that she purchased it in, the neighborhood that she purchased the building in was Inglewood. This is the block that I grew up on. This is a present day Google Street View photo of the block that I grew up on, on 62nd and Loomis in the heart of Inglewood. And I know it's probably surprising to a lot of people because they tell you that Inglewood is just a neighborhood full of criminals and it's poverty stricken. However, Inglewood and West Inglewood together create Greater Inglewood. And Greater Inglewood is the third largest neighborhood in Chicago. A lot of people don't know that. And so quite frankly, there's many different kinds of blocks in Inglewood. And this is one of them. This was a close knit block. So just imagine how it was 30, 40 years ago. This is how close the block was. Everyone knew each other. So much so that my first friend in life lived two doors down in this house right here. His name was Raymond. His mother was the bully of my mother. So this is how close the block was. I was literally best friends with the child of my mother's bully. And my grandmother's best friend lived right next door. Her name was Miss Patterson. She was what we would call the candy lady. She sold candy on her porch every summer. She made homemade ice cream and sold it to the kids for 25 cents. I literally played on this block every day. And this was the block that I was living on when I started high school. And now, I started high school in 1993. So that means there was no cell phones, no technology for you to understand where to go and address. So teenagers in Chicago in the 90s, we had to know Chicago's grid map system. It was just no way around. You had to understand that the address was a coordinate to a specific location. And so I would have to walk from this block, one block down to 63rd in Loomis to catch the train to be at school by eight o'clock. I had to be at the bus stop by 5.45 a.m because my high school was 15 miles north in a north side neighborhood very different from, from Inglewood. And so this was my first time as a 13 year old girl going out of my neighborhood every day by myself to a new neighborhood. And it was on the commute that I noticed a lot of things that was different about my neighborhood. It's in a very, established and affluent neighborhood. It is a selective enrollment school in Chicago. And it was a very significant commute. It was on this commute because there was no cell phones. I was either listening to my Walkman or looking out the window or reading a book or falling asleep. Most of the time I would look out the window and I would notice that my neighborhood had more vacant lots, had vacant lots in general. And the neighborhood that my high school was in didn't have any. And I noticed that my neighborhood had a lot of beauty supply stores, which I loved, where you go and get your hair supplies. And the neighborhood that my high school was in didn't have any, and I thought that was strange. I noticed that my neighborhood had a lot of liquor stores and fast food restaurants, and the neighborhood that my high school was in had cafes and restaurants. And this just stuck with me, because I thought it was so strange. And I wondered who made those decisions? because I like a lot of the stuff in the neighborhood that my high school was in. But the one thing that I noticed that I had never realized before I started high school was that the streets in my neighborhood of Englewood extended all the way north to the neighborhood that my high school was in. So I really kind of knew where I was going, but the streets looked so different. Streets like Ashland, Walcott, Polina. I noticed that they don't look the same in my neighborhood. And so this is my high school. 
Lane Tech. It has the largest student body in all of Chicago public high schools. It has a student body of 4,000. Now, in addition to being a large high school, it was also very diverse because it accepted students from all over Chicago. And in the 90s, schools were able to curate the racial demographic of their high school, of their student body to reflect the racial demographic of Chicago. So even though it was 4,000 students, you had equal percentage of black, Latino, Asian, and white. Today, they're not able to do that because of federal law that passed saying you cannot use race as a criteria for educational um, institutions. And that happened about 10, 12 years ago. So the racial demographic of my high school is very different today. But I say that to say, when I got to high school, it was a whole new world. This little black girl from Inglewood was going to meet kids from all over Chicago, from neighborhoods I had never even heard of. I met my first group of Latino friends from a neighborhood called Wicker Park, the Wicker Park of the 90s, not today. We won't get into that right now. And then from a neighborhood of Humboldt Park and Logan Square, strong, prideful group of friends about their culture. And these were the friends that told me, you must know the cultural difference between being Puerto Rican and Mexican. We are not the same. And then I also had my friends from other uh, Latin countries, Guatemala, who told me they're also Latino. I didn't know. And then I had a group of friends who I thought were black like me, but lived on the north side of Chicago primarily. And they were first, they were first generation immigrants from immigrant families, from places I didn't even know black people lived at at the time. Belize, Panama, Nigeria, of course, Jamaica. And then I also had my friends who were Asian, who quickly put me in check and said, we are not all Chinese, we are Korean. We are Indian, and we don't all speak Chinese. We speak Mandarin. They were the ones that educated me about this. Then I also had my friends who were Filipino that I mistook as being Latino. And they told me, no, 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 no. We're Asian. However, colonialization is the reason that our names are Spanish. And then I had my group of white friends that grew up in Chicago that I would have never met if it weren't for high school. One particular friend named Steve Jakevich. We talked every day in algebra class about hip hop, and it was the first Polish name I had ever said out of my mouth. And then I met a group of friends who were black like me from Chicago's West Side. I didn't even know what the West Side was. And they told me it's from Cicero to Laramie to Laramie on down. And I was like, I didn't even know it was streets after Cicero. So every day we got to know each other. We hung out in each other's neighborhoods because hip hop was really strong in the 90s in Chicago. That's when Kanye West was still here being, becoming a producer and a rapper. So we got to know each other's neighborhoods regardless of what the news said. Through our friendships, we visited each other's neighborhoods and we quickly realized that our city was segregated. So just to give you a little excerpt on you know, the activity, the hip hop activity of the 90s in high school. I'm just gonna play a small clip of a talent show where my white friend, Steve Jakevich, was beatboxing for me. I won't play it long, because I'm gonna be in <laughs> making this commute to high school. But then also on the weekends, I got involved in a program called Young Chicago Authors. And it exposed me to other artistic mediums like photography. But this program was also in a north side neighborhood of Wicker Park. So every Saturday I was making another commute to Young Chicago Authors every Saturday morning, all throughout the year. 
And so it reaffirmed the same observations that I had going to high school. So as you can see, I quickly understood that Chicago was segregated. I just didn't understand why. The map that you see before you is a map of Chicago segregation. The blue represents the neighborhoods that are predominantly black. The pink and purplish area that you see represent the neighborhoods that are predominantly white. The orange that you see are the neighborhoods that are predominantly Latino. And the neon green that you see in the center and speckled throughout the top are the neighborhoods that are predominantly Asian. Chicago is the most segregated city in our country, and it has been that way since before my grandmother got here. And the reason we are the most segregated is because other metropolitan cities, their segregation has shifted over time. However, Chicago's has stayed just like this for decades. And so as you can see, these three maps kind of show you that I was not riding to school and writing to young Chicago authors, I was actually riding through Chicago's segregation. And this is when I started to make the connection between geography, value, and race. And I understood that my neighborhood was not getting the same investment. I just didn't understand why. But I understood that when you segregate people, it makes it easier to discriminate against them. And because I was so frustrated at this fact, I wanted to do something. And especially in 2016, the presidential election year, you all are old enough to remember that Chicago was being talked about a lot in international news, primarily because President Obama was running against him. And so they talked about Chicago's gun violence so much to the point that it really pissed me off because they weren't talking about the larger context of how neighborhoods struggling with gun violence ended up with these issues. These neighborhoods were disinvested long before gun violence became an issue. And I wanted to create a project that would clearly show that the issues that black neighborhoods in Chicago are struggling with is not because of gun violence. Rather that gun violence is a symptom of decades long of disinvestment. So that's when I decided to create Folded Map. I thought about all of the observations I had in high school. I thought about the streets that were the same in my neighborhood of Inglewood and the neighborhoods up north. And I just thought, what if I were to fold Chicago's map at its zero point, which is downtown Madison Street? The neighborhoods that would touch my home neighborhood of Inglewood are Chicago's north side, predominantly white neighborhoods of Rogers Park, Andersonville, and Edgewater. So I decided to start taking photos of addresses that have, that are similar, but 15 to 18 miles apart that exist in my neighborhood, Inglewood, and the north side sister neighborhoods of Inglewood. What you see is 6900 North Ashland and 6900 South Ashland. The 6900 South Ashland address bus stop is actually a way larger intersection. Whereas the Rogers Park North Side address is a small intersection. But the South Ashland has never had a bench or a bus shelter. So you can imagine people hate this bus stop in the wintertime. Then I also took video footage of what those two intersections look like side by side. And I want you to think about some of the major observations that, you see, that just stand out to you. And I'm sure the observations that you have aren't the result of gun violence. Gun violence can't make a neighborhood not have street taken care of. Gun violence alone can't make an entire building remain vacant with only a liquor store occupied. These are things that your elected officials, beyond your alderman, your mayor, are supposed to take care of. 
The intersection on South Ashland doesn't even have a crossing. Where do they go? Another accident address pair was 6300 North Carolina and 6300 South Carolina. As you can see from homes that were never purchased and the value of the land was much greater than the home. And then you have vacant homes that will soon become a vacant lot. But as you can see, representative of the little girl that's riding her bike, you still have people who live on those blocks. And this is what they have to deal with. Whereas North Carolina, it's fully flourishing to the point that they're proud and have an American flag. But what happened was, as I was photographing these homes, I started to meet people in these homes. And I was skeptical about telling them about the project, but I did. And specifically, some of the North Side residents whose homes I photographed was interested in the project. And I asked them the questions that you see before here, before you hear. But more importantly, I asked them if they wanted to meet someone else other than me who lives in Inglewood. And they started saying yes. And they said, unfortunately, I've only heard, I only know about Inglewood from what I hear in the news. And we all know what that is. But they agreed. And I asked them the same question that I asked you all, how did you come to live in your neighborhood? And so I decided to pair my first set of map twins together. People who live on the same blocks, but different sides of town. The first map twin I'm gonna in introduce to you is John and Paula who live on North Hermitage and 15 miles south, their map twin Maurice who lives on South Hermitage. And trust me, they are as different as they look, but they decided to meet each other through the project. And I'm going to play for you just a small clip of them answering the question of what's missing in your neighborhood. I wouldn't mind seeing a theater, um, a bowling alley, um, maybe um, some type of center for the youth to kind of go hang out at or have some, some things to do when they get out of school um, or to be able to be exposed to different artistic options to um, just, just kind of give them something to do. Um, aside kind of like hanging outside and finding different ways or, or getting into trouble um, or that, those trouble even being an option because if you have nothing to do of course it's like there's trouble rating right over there so yeah <laughs> those are some uh, good suggestions yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know <laughs> what are we yeah well, um, a lot of our needs are I mean, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure we could, but, uh, yeah. So, just recently, the um, international media outlet, Reuters, did a follow-up on Folded Map, and I'm going to play for you uh, this footage, this coverage, so you can also get an update on the Map Twins that you just met who actually have remained in contact. This is a house on Chicago's south side in a predominantly black neighborhood. This is a house at the same address on Chicago's north side in a predominantly white neighborhood. The photos are part of the folded map project by artist Tunika Johnson from Chicago's Englewood neighborhood. I'm sure the words you've heard to describe Englewood include black, dangerous, poor, gun violence. However, Inglewood is where I grew up and still live. Johnson says she wanted to explore the effects of urban segregation and dispel notions that people should fear coming to her neighborhood. Even though we struggle with issues of gun violence, it's not like soon as you step on any block, you're just going to get shot potentially like that's just not a reality but that is literally what people think 
But what started as a project in 2017 focused on homes quickly turned into a project focused on the people in those homes. It just naturally evolved into me one day asking one resident if they wanted to meet their MAP twin resident, and they said yes. And I was like, oh my gosh, what am I going to have them talk about? She decided to interview them together, posing at times uncomfortable questions such as how much they paid for their house. Jonathan Silverstein and his wife Paula Herman say it was an eye-opening experience. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess it is. It is really striking, uh, you know, how lucky we are, and we certainly don't think of ourselves as living in a rich neighborhood. But compared to some, we we are very privileged. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, their north side neighborhood boasts a wide array of shops, restaurants, and food markets, their map twin, Maurice Perkins, says he needs to travel far just to find a grocery store. They couldn't even imagine being in a community or a community not having the things that is, I guess, basic necessities. And Perkins says they still stay in touch. That was like a genuine connection, right? It was like nothing forced or fake. We had a conversation, um, learn each other's differences in community. Now Johnson is working to expand Folded Map, inspired to continue after the recent racial justice protests, and is convinced the only way to make progress is through relationship building. And we need to know that it's going to be difficult. People are going to stumble and say stuff that is inappropriate because we haven't had these conversations collectively as a large public. And that's why I'm really excited about Folded Maps, Map Twins interviews being a model of how awkward but necessary those conversations are. The next iteration of Folded Map will include resources for people to help desegregate their own cities from meeting their Map Twin to simply running errands in a different neighborhood. And so it was my hope with the Folded Map project uh, that started out just as an art project and my social justice response to defend my neighborhood and neighborhoods like it that have experienced decades of disinvestment due to the redlining that you just were educated on. And I wanted people to understand that history, the history and the impact of that history is still with us today, not only systematically, but also within our social network. And my question that I tend to pose to people who encounter Folded Map is, does our city segregation reflect how you want to interact with each other today? And if it doesn't, then it's going to require relationship building because policies, laws have not improved Chicago segregation. And it's because of segregation in itself that has created this divide where we can't interact to learn and unlearn a lot of the stereotypes that originally started through those Hulk maps and, and redlining. And so in closing, I just hope that people take away from folded map that it's about relationship building. We have never had an opportunity to do that with each other, especially in Chicago. And so with respect to time, I'm going to close and hope that you will be able to share with me some of your thoughts or some of your questions later on. Thank you, Tanika. So in the interest of time, we do have a few minutes to ask questions. So we'll have time for one or two questions, but we do have a, a poll question to ask you as you're thinking about the question. Um, and this uh, question is related to community resources. And so um, this question actually came up during Tanika's presentation. And the question is, what resources are ser or services are missing from your neighborhood? And um, please feel free to add your questions to the chat box as well. We'll have time for one or two questions. Wow. All right, so we 
have about 10 more seconds for this poll. Just want to give everyone enough time to answer. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. All right, and I'm going to share the results. So it looks like about 27% of our participants said reliable public transportation. Another 25% um, said gardens, parks, and open spaces. 44% said mental health services. 28% um, said entertainment. Um, and then we have 31% said nothing at all. You know, you have everything you need in your community. Um, and no one said all of the above. And so um, in seeing these responses, we can see that, you know, there are great disparities in the types of resources we have in our community. Some people have everything they need and some people don't. And so that's a question to consider um, in your you know, small group discussions later on today, thinking about um, this topic for today. So um, I don't see any questions in the chat box. So um, if we don't have any questions, we will move right along to our, our next session, which is the panel discussion, which will be moderated by uh, Brittany Palmer. So I'm gonna hand it over to you, Brittany. Thanks, Michelle. Oh, yeah, there we go. And thank you so much, Tanika. That was super insightful um, and, and really, really, really good information. Uh, I want to start by um, asking everyone to please uh, turn off your video and hide your non-video um, kind of speaker so that you will only, you're only seeing uh, the person that is speaking on the panel. It'll just make it a little easier instead of everyone saying boxes and names and stuff like that. So if you turn off your video and hide your, your, your non-video participants, uh, we'll be good to go. So to begin, I want to introduce our panelists. Um, we have Kristen Cook from the Partnership for, for Southern Equity. We have um, Chandra Christmas Rouse from, uh, excuse me, I can't see, it's very small. Uh, Enterprise Community Partners, Samuel Shimbaga from the Atlanta Regional Commission and Cindy Chambray from um, the Chicago Metropolitan Association for Planning or CMAP. Um, to start, I have a question for all of our panelists. Um, based on the work and the presentation Tanika Johnson just shared with us, can you draw any parallels between her work and what you see in your everyday work as planners and community advocates? I can go ahead and start. Um, as planners and communi community advocates, um, this is Cindy Cambrai, by the way. It's very nice to meet you all and always learning something new from Tanika Johnson. So thank you very much for that. Um, I, I'm, I'm also in Chicago. Uh, we work in the Chicago land area, and I honestly think that a lot of the things that Tanika spoke about are things that are, they're common. You know, you see this all the time. You see uh, people that are segregated, and ultimately what you see is that some people, as a result of this segregation, are moved into extreme poverty and instances of pollution um, where you know, on the north side in places where things you said are predominantly white neighborhoods, um, you know, you see more affluent communities, you see lots of resources and amenities that are available to everyone. Um, this isn't something rare just here in Chicago, um, but you see it across the nation in major metropolitan areas. Thank you. Anyone from Atlanta want to share? And I'll repeat the question. Um, we're based off of Tanika's work and her presentation today. Um, can you draw any parallels between her her work and uh, what you see in your in your everyday work? So, uh, <clears throat> go ahead, Kirsten. No, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I should say I, I saw a lot of familiar names, and I want to give a shout out to my CMAP. Uh, peeps, because uh, for folks who are on this call and don't know, I used to be at CMAP. So good to see you, Cindy. Um, hey, Sam. It's good hey. to see you, too. And uh, I see I see a bunch of folks. I'm not going to call them out right now, but um, <laughs> good, good, to, good to be back virtually. Um, so I, <clears throat> you know, Tanika, again, it was, it was, a, it was a great presentation, a lot of good information. Unfortunately, it's not, it's, it's nothing 
new in, in at least all the places that I've worked um, ac across the country. So, so my experience, I've <clears throat> now having worked in Atlanta, we have, we have similar um, sort of inequities that you see across the region uh, where you go from one, one, one part of the town to another part of the town along the same corridor and, and the characteristics change pretty dramatically. Um, so I, I have, you know, I've always been, and I'm going to digress a little bit, but uh, hopefully my point makes a bit more sense, is uh, I, I always go back to like what, uh, this, this to me is not very surprising in a way, because uh, having grown up in India, when I came to the U.S., uh, I was, I was, uh, America to me was built on this capitalist model, which is uh, you have to have a lot of prosperity, you have to have a lot of goods, and you have to have success. And um, we always, uh, <clears throat> that success always came at a cost. And uh, by, by, by design, the the <clears throat> you could only be successful economically if you were able to disenfranchise or or um, put some people at a disadvantage. So 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 to me the notion of how America prospers is is just it, it's it's that that's the model. Um, it, it's why like we can we can send rockets into space which can land themselves, but we can't figure out a way that our uh, voting system works. Uh, it, it, it's as much as we like to say it's it's sort of a flaw in the system, it is a design. Now, I'll, I'll stop rambling there, um, but I think what, what I have always worked with is like we all come from, we're, we're all guilty in a way, and um, we often find ourselves in planning in, in an us versus them situation of like, uh, you know, there's some people who are causing problem, it's not us. Um, uh, I, I've always believed that the, it, that the system is built that we're all guilty, but we have to come from a common understanding that this happens not just because a few are doing this, we're all playing our part. Um, uh, uh, so I, I just wanna say that this is something which happens all across America. We've seen it in Atlanta. You go to the North part of Atlanta, uh, this is the, uh, the circumstances are very different. You come around the airport if you've ever been and you go to the communities around the airport, uh, it's, it's a completely different environment. Um, and, and that is uh, that is to a certain degree, in my opinion, by design. Um, so I'll stop there and I can talk more about that later, but. Thank you. Um, Kirsten or Chandra, did you, either of you wanna, wanna add from a kind of community perspective? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm a big fan of Tanika, so really excited to think about all the overlaps of our work. Um, so for me, a lot of my work is now looking at healing centered engagement in communities and the way that we can implement that in urban planning work. And so I think um, often what I learned from the Folded Map Project is about how we're kind of celebrating ourselves for no longer redlining or no longer discriminating um, or think, you know, we have the Fair Housing Act, but we see this very clear relationship building that was never done. And so we, um, it's not enough to just uh, stop doing the harm, but what does it actually mean to tend to this wound that has been created um, and continuously exasperated by policies built in the same logics that formed redlining, the same logics that um, formed urban renewal and gentrification as we see this ever evolving um, kind of structures of violence. And so I think as a planner, it's really important that we don't just focus on anti-racism or um, just to stop doing harm, but to actually lead with healing and lead with the humanity of folks to deal with the pain that has been done, um, and just uh, as opposed to harm reduction or trauma-informed work. Thank you. That's awesome. Kirsten, what about you? Um, I think all the other panelists have made some really good points that I agree with, so I don't have a whole lot to add to that except that um, Thank you, Tanika, that was really cool to see. And um, as someone with a planning background, um, I just think it's really awesome that Chicago can have map twins. Um, that's not really something Atlanta has just because we don't have the same sort of grid system. Um, it is always a fold, always a fold. <laughs> <laughs> it won't be as clean in Atlanta, but. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, just that these same policy issues have played out um, and affected communities over time in pretty much every city across the US. Um, the nuances are a little different. Um, I think that we probably see some more um, public transportation issues in Atlanta um, as a result of that and um, how poverty has become more suburbanized and we have not built the infrastructure for that in Atlanta. Um, but I think the Chicago area is seeing um, similar issues. So I don't have a whole lot else to add that's different from what the panelists have already said there. That's great. Uh, my next question is around the, the fix, right? So can planning actually fix the inequities in our communities? Like what is what is equitable planning and investment look like? What are some examples in the Atlanta and the Chicago regions uh, of, of planning done right and done, and done equitably so that folks are, so that we're not running into these same issues and we're not just kind of reducing the harm, but we're actually looking towards the future to improve the way that we do our planning. What are some, some good examples of, of good planning, of good investment? And that's yeah, I think the, oh, sorry. Um, you know, mine might give somebody else a chance to go first this time if anybody wants to jump in. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in, Cindy. Okay, uh, sorry, I just didn't want to go first again. No, you're you're fine. So so planning, I, I feel like is in in general, uh, mo most planning, I'd say, is guilty of having preconceived notions of what needs to happen in a community. Like I've been guilty of this. You go into a planning process, you sort of you think there's a certain planning process that you have to run through where you look at the data, you look at doing some meetings, you, you draw some conclusions, and then you come up with a set of recommendations, you run it by, like, do some public outreach, and you're like, you're done. And that's a great plan. As long as you get 100 people to show up at an open house, you feel like that's a successful planning process. Um, to be honest, that's just not true. Uh, and it's it leads to a lot of... Uh, the, the conversation you hear or the term you hear often, we don't want to create something that sits on a shelf. Um, often those plans are plans that end up sitting on a shelf because uh, they're, they're, they're not grounded in what the community actually needs. Um, we had this interesting example where we were working with the city of East Point. It's another community, which is uh, south side of Atlanta, where they were trying to come up with an urban agriculture study and essentially the point of the study was what is what does food mean to you um, to the community and what we did in there just as an example i'm not trying to say this is a fix for how to do things um, but i definitely think it's an improvement is that we spent instead of going in and just coming up with a bunch of maps and data and uh, doing two or three public meetings here at church and a, and a weekend and a festival which all sounds great but what we ended up doing was we spent the first six months just just talking to the community. We spent as much time as we could, uh, not really telling them what the study was, but we just asked them a bunch of questions in terms of uh, what they want, would like to see, what they what they think when they think about the role of food in their family, in their community, uh, and uh, it, you know it 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 took a while, um, uh, but we. We, we talked to a lot of the folks in the community. We engaged a lot of the farmers and the growers. Um, and it, it, it was a very atypical planning process. It, but um, to cut a long story short, at the end of the day, we feel like what we have in terms of a plan uh, has a lot more community buy-in. It, it, it really reflects their need. And it's a lot more actionable. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, Damn, so I can right. Sorry. Sam, I completely agree with you. I was actually going to give the same example. I mean, not the same example, but, you know, the same uh, place-based planning uh, example is that, you know, Sam's absolutely right. We go into these communities and many times planners have these preconceived notions of like, let's just check the box, right? This is the planning process. But in my opinion, when you involve those people that are disenfranchised and disadvantaged is when you really get to the root of the issues in the community and really learn about what's important to the community. Um, I think some of the most successful planning is when you go in and you do 
you know, an extreme engagement process and not just outreach because outreach is sort of just making sure that you check that box and going out into the community and saying, you know, yes, we've had that 100 person meeting that Sam was referencing, but engagement is more of, you know, trying different ways to go out and get into the community. So it's not just having this, you know, open house where 100 people attend this meeting, but it's going to people where they are you know, making sure that, you know, you go to the local school council meeting where the parents are, making sure that you go to the church, making sure that you have meetings where there is childcare provided and food provided, because let's face it, when you are already experiencing such difficulties in your own personal life, which is the case in a lot of these low income, high needs communities, it's really difficult to, you know, you've already, you're already working a full-time job, if you have kids, that's a task in itself. You know, you have the household chores, you have to cook dinner, you don't have time to come to these community meetings. So it's important to get out there where everyone is and make sure that everyone's voices are heard and that it's something that is for the community by the community because nobody knows the community better than the residents that have lived there for ages. Thank you. Um, Chandra, did you wanna add anything regarding planning done right planning done equitably what is that what does that look like what are some, some good examples that that you might point to yeah i think i was going to highlight a lot of the things that cindy brought up in terms of what what it means to actually listen to people and speak in the language that um like most centers them and their values. I think I go back to like what are the values of the community and starting the conversation there so that we have a shared understanding of what we're actually building toward. But I think to answer your question about what is kind of equitable planning, um, I actually think we're, to answer it a, a little differently, we're in this moment right now. I think as folks, as you see ongoing uprisings, as you see people questioning public space and what it means to make that democratic, as you look at what's happening in Grant Park, I mean, a, a planner made Grant Park, someone decided to put up the statue of Christopher Columbus. I think we're seeing people's values being um, built in real time in space by the way that they take that space up and, and demand for a different possibility. I think it's about <clears throat> the ways that not only the statues we put up holding each other accountable, but how we hold that history accountable. So to me, that's what the most equitable planning could look like. Awesome. So if, I, if I can add one thing, Brittany, well, one thing we learned when we were doing this work in East Point for, for our steering committee was local farmers and food advocates. What we learned and why the, the, the project ended up being better is that planning, I feel like somehow we've convinced ourselves needs to mediate, right? We, we need to make everyone happy. We need to build consensus, which essentially at the end of the day sometimes results in nobody getting what they want. And it's sort of like trying to give everyone something. Um, and I feel like what we were able to do in that was, what I learned from that was like planning, it's okay for planning to be uncomfortable. It's, it's okay to have uncomfortable conversations where you don't feel very comfortable in, in, uh, in, in answering something or, or you need to, take a step back and think about things differently, or you have to um, look at things from a different perspective. I feel like that is something which uh, planning may be starting to do more, but I, I don't think has historically done a, done a good job of. Awesome, thank you. Um, I wanna end with um, a couple of, of quick questions. Sneeko, first for you, you say find the fold. What does that mean? What is, uh, cause I have an idea of what I, what does it mean to you? Uh, well, you know, I am an artist at heart. So I love to use things that, that are up for different kinds of interpretations um, that still have the same authentic sentiment. And uh, just geographically speaking, uh, it doesn't matter if your uh, state city is not on a grid map system. Um, that was just something unique to Chicago that made it very easy for me to mathematically pair up addresses and blocks. But mm -hmm. places like DC, where they're on quadrants and Atlanta, even though you don't have a grid system, you have a line. There's always a street that divides one disinvested neighborhood from an invested neighborhood. And it doesn't have to be exact. Just find that fold, find that street, and 
have them touch somehow, some way, through people, through images, through projects. And so that's what I mean by find the fold. You don't need the exact coordinates. You just have to find the divide and yeah. introduce, create a bridge. Absolutely. And I would um, venture to say, especially just kind of peeking in the chat, um, Atlanta is, is having, my, our Atlanta participants are having a hard time with our public transit system. And so, you know, that's a fold right there, you know, like where is transit accessible? Where is it not? Where is housing accessible? Where is it not? Um, so thank you for answering that. No really, problem. I do want to, um, let's see, ask a, a, just a, a question on um, to Chandra, I believe, on how planners can improve, to Chandra and to, to Kirsten, actually, how can planners improve improve a community without creating gentrification and then finally after that question yeah that's a tough one right and after that question is not really wanna, it has a simple answer, <laughs> simple answer do you want to share your, your <laughs> well i find that in chicago the conversation about gentrification is always focused on the gentrifiers mm -hmm. and to a certain degree uh yes People who gentrify a neighborhood should be aware of the existing community, but mm -hmm. it is still not their fault that investment in stores and whatever it is the new population want pops up wherever they go. The issue is the investment should not follow a specific population. And in Chicago, that specific population has consistently been young white families and professionals. So mm -hmm. they shouldn't have to feel wherever they move, and this is young white professionals, wherever they move, oh gosh, we have to, a, a fear, or you know, we have to defend our presence here. The reality is we need to um, hold our elected officials in our city accountable and say investment should not follow a specific population. Neighborhoods should be invested before a specific population goes in. So it still comes down to the root, which is money following a preferred population based mm -hmm. on capitalism and racism. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Um, Kirsten and Chandra, I'm curious to your thoughts on gentrification and then if each of you could be thinking about um, our final uh, kind of question that I have for you is how these amazing students who are, are so interested in this topic can be involved. So first, Kirsten and Chandra, could you please um, share with us your thoughts on kind of building and improving community without investment, or me, excuse me, without gentrification. Sure. Um, yeah, like Tanika said, I think that um, investment can happen in a community without displacing the people that currently live there. And um, part of it comes down to uh, high expectation from the community um, and from its leaders that um, developers and investment need to follow their the community's rules. Um, and so really listening to the people who live there and um, listening to the requirements that they've set, um, particularly those who are most vulnerable to um, rising housing costs and to being potentially displaced. Um, and so I think one um, really powerful tool for that is community benefits agreements. Um, in which a developer is required by a signed contract to provide specific amenities or to mitigate um, negative impacts on a local community so that um, it ensures that good things and investment are coming into a neighborhood. Um, not that we're just completely eliminating new investment, um, but that the people who are living there, um, the legacy residents and the culture that's already been there um, can stay. Um, and we have also, um, ironically been working in the city of East Point, um, the Partnership for Southern Equity, um, to prepare an equity and inclusion strategic plan. Um, and that will heavily involve um, this really deeply rooted community engagement process that we've been talking about and not just asking community members um, to show up to meetings, but um, doing some capacity building um, and helping to equip them in how to advocate for what they want to see in their community. And so that's just one example of what we're doing. Um, for those who may not know, East Point is just south of the city of Atlanta. Um, and so they're facing a lot of these um, gentrifying and displacement pressures that are coming um, as Atlanta continues to grow. So um, those are just a few tools. There's a lot of policies that can be put in place um, beforehand, as long as we listen to the community first. 
Um, Chandra, really quickly, we are running out of time, but did you have anything that you, you wanted to add regarding um, community investment, uh, avoiding gentrification and uh, things, anything of that nature? From a yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So a lot of my work looks at community ownership models. So I think that is the most effective way to retain and um, keep legacy populations as well as uh, grow wealth within communities. I think to the example of a CBA, um, follow the Obama Presidential Center if you want to crash course in the politics of CBAs and, and what, they're, um, what they can do and what they can't do and how political that gets. I think that's another example to follow, but really thinking about shared ownership models from both commercial and real estate and residential. Um, but ultimately, I think gentrification is a symptom and we have to focus on uh, the systems in place um, and proximity to power and whiteness and how it formulates the system of gentrification. So all really powerful uh, perspectives and suggestions and, and, you know, we're having a great conversation. Panelists, if you, in three words or less, how would you advise all these awesome youth leaders to get involved in, in these issues? And Tanika, you're included in that as well. Well, first of all, I just want to congratulate all these youth leaders for taking the initiative of signing up for this program because it's an awesome program. And this just shows your commitment uh, to these issues of equity. Um, but if I could do it in a couple of words, it's just, you know, make sure that the voices of the disadvantage, disadvantaged and disenfranchised are at the table. I think if you start there, you'll, you'll find a way. Thanks, Cindy. Um, I'll, I'll just add that, um, I'll just add that I believe that it's you all taking the opportunity to get to know the people in your cohort. You have this wonderful opportunity uh, that you've been connected with uh, individuals you have a shared passion with, some who have a different lived experience than you, and use this time to understand and learn about each other because you all are also part of the solution and have experienced the impact of these issues. So do not remove your own frame of reference, your own lived experience uh, from everything that you are learning and studying and just use this time to connect with each other because it will prove to be a wonderful, powerful reference uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. I'd say um, learn your community's history. That's um, most powerful in understanding the equity issues. Sorry, this is more than three words as well. Um, I would also just put in a plug for the Transformation Academy in Atlanta. If you are an Atlanta resident, um, we do an academy that's focused on um, equity and planning issues as well. And um, we actually just finished ours for this summer, but hopefully we'll be in person next summer. Um, so check out Partnership for Southern Equity. Sam, how should folks get involved? I'd say, right, I mean, I think it's already been said in, in many different ways is that you just I, uh, educate yourselves as much as you can. Learn learn more about why inequities are happening. I, I, I To be honest, you, you just have to continually educate yourself because you're the folks that as we are planning for, you're in the communities, you are talking to your neighbors, your friends, everyone else and and the more you guys build the capacity i think someone used the term capacity building you're building more capacity by talking to all those folks who i think i was observing in these chat was are the folks who are showing up to our meetings and being like transit sucks it's it's dangerous it's this or that or um and and as you all are learning more about that educating yourselves you can talk to your parents your friends and all those people and that's the best kind of uh, outreach and engagement that we can hope for. Um, and so I, I would, I would just implore you all to com continue to do that. Awesome. Go ahead, Chandra. Yeah. So, um, one resource that I would plug to kind of as a next step is black space. Um, it's a collective of black urbanists around the country. And what I think it does a great job of, of taking the values of the black community that's always been oppositional to urban planning and urban space and put it into a manifesto. So I would encourage you all to think about your own values of your community, think about how you can work within that community to create your manifesto for what urban planning should be and not what it is, because 
traditional urban planning is exhaustive and we need a new model that serves all of us and all of our identities. Um, so I think that's a great example of how to create something that can hold you and uh, your whole self. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Tanika. Um, thank you for all for your, for your awesome questions. I'm going to end this panel conversation with the advice of, I'm going to steal the words of Tanika Johnson, find your fold, figure out what's important to you and make a difference. Um, and I'm, then I'm going to go ahead and pass it along to Matt. All right. Hey, everyone. Um, thank you so much to our panelists for those awesome um, uh, really awesome answers to, to these really hard questions. Um, uh, we're getting ready to move into the last uh, section of this session, which is a small group discussion uh, that will happen in Zoom breakout rooms. Uh, we've heard today about uh, a bunch of different issues that impact injustice in urban space. Um, a lot of the uh, conversation goes back to red although um, there have been many uh, the government has has reinforced these these um, inequities um, and so I'd like to start by uh, casting a poll um, real quick before we go any further so as uh, uh, before this session you were asked to watch the Adam ruins everything video uh, on the history of suburbs uh, Adam describes the impact of redlining um, on perpetuating racist lending. Um, and so the question is between 1934 and 1968, what percentage of loans were given to white families? We'll give this uh, another 10 seconds or so to see, uh, see what people think. All right, Michelle, you wanna end the poll for us? So, uh, looks like about 30% uh, uh, of people said 70%, 69% um, uh, 69 of people said 98%. The answer is 98%. Um, so for the first, for the 34 years after redlining maps were introduced, all but 2% of home loans were given to white families. Um, and so with that little bit of information, um, I'd like to move into um, the small group discussions uh, where there'll be an opportunity to talk a little bit about redlining and how redlining uh, impacts the communities that we all live in. Um, and even though redlining doesn't exist anymore, the ways in which mortgage lending practices uh, today uh, resemble uh, redlining maps of the past. Um, so if we can go to the next slide real quick. Um, these, these are hard conversations, um, and so we'd like to lay out just a couple of quick ground rules for these discussions. Um, appreciate that everyone uh, in the room has good intentions and biases. Everyone is doing the best they can from the current state of awareness. Speak for yourself, uh, not on behalf of your identity or other identities. Be open to feeling uncomfortable. All growth comes with some discomfort. And finally, understand that all groups of a single race can have or excuse me, understand that groups of a single race can have multiple perspectives, and even the most diverse groups will have missing perspectives. Um, so with these guidelines in mind, um, we're gonna go ahead and launch the small groups. Um, and so please, uh, when you get into the small group, turn your webcam back on, um, and there'll be a facilitator from CMAP or uh, ARC to, uh, to lead you through the next uh, um, 15 to 20 minutes of conversation. Thank you. Thanks so much. Hello everyone, if you all could turn your webcams on, that'll be great. Then we can get started on our small group discussion. If there's any problems turning on webcams, please um, let me know, but I think it'll be, it'll be the best if we're able to turn on our webcams. Uh, okay, thanks Samir, no problem. Thanks for letting us know. Yeah, I I can't use mine either because I have really slow internet service. I'm sorry.
Oh, it's okay. Thanks for thanks for letting us know, Christina. That's no problem at all. Um, so I, before we get started on our conversation, because we are going to be talking about some difficult topics, I thought it'd be a good idea to start off the discussion with just introducing ourselves. Um, um, for CMAP staff, such as Courtney and I, we'll introduce ourselves and talk about um, how long we've been at CMAP um, and how we got into planning. Um, and then for students, for everyone else, if you could do name, um, where you're from, whether you're from Atlanta or Chicago, um, what school you're attending and what your grade you are. Um, so if, if that sounds fine, um, I'll go ahead and start us off. Um, my name is Beatrix. I am a planning intern at CMAP. So I started at CMAP in the beginning of June and I got into planning school because I, um, unlike everyone here who is exposed to planning way earlier than me, I've learned about planning when I was a senior of my, um, the second semester of my senior year in undergraduate studies. So I got into planning really late, which is why I'm currently going through a master's program right now to um, get an actual planning degree. I wish I learned about planning earlier. I feel like I could have get, gotten jump started on my um, career and interest a lot earlier, but um, you know, every every person's journey is their own, and I'm glad I'm glad about where I am. So it's really nice to meet everyone. Hi everyone, my name is Courtney Barnes. I am an engagement associate at CMAP, and I am also one of your FLIP co-directors. Um, I know, woo -woo. Um, Beatrice, did you want me to share anything about? urban planning or how I got into it or yeah I think so I think how you got into urban planning what your interests are yeah so I actually learned about urban planning very late I learned about it when I got into grad school <laughs> so I was mostly on the policy side I had more interest in the issues that were just brought up you know housing um, discriminatory you know housing practices like redlining and more mortgage lending practices and um, that kind of drove me to pursue my degree in public administration. Um, but working at CMAP, I'm more so on the public outreach side. So I help with, you know, getting public feedback on these type of issues that they're experiencing in, within our region. All right, thanks for sharing, Courtney. All right, um, so who wants to start us off in introducing themselves? If not, I'll call on someone. I can start. All right, thanks, Christina. Go ahead. Um, so I'm from Harvey. It's a south suburb of Chicago. I'm currently going to be a sophomore at the University of Illinois um, at Urbana-Champaign. All right, that's awesome. Oh, okay. I didn't no, know if that was it. Um, you can tell me or tell us about um, how you got interested in planning. Well, um, Right now I'm pursuing my major in civil engineering. And since I wasn't able to get an internship due to COVID and the current state, um, I decided to join the FLIP program because planning does have a lot to do with civil engineering. Um, and so I thought it'd be good to expand my knowledge. That's awesome, good for you for taking that initiative. Who wants to go next for us? I can go. Okay, great. Thanks, Erin. Hi. Sorry. I can only turn my camera on when I talk because my internet gets really weird. Um, but I'm Erin Ludwig. I'm a communications and outreach intern at CMAP, and I started here last September uh, working with the communications team to make information about urban planning more accessible to our constituents. And I'm a master's student in urban planning, but like Beatrix, I learned about it relatively late. I didn't, I was about a year and a half into college, but I was interested in planning because of just how I saw it intersected all of my interests in sociology and history and community engagement. And I wanted to keep doing that work uh, as I started my career. Great, thanks for sharing, Erin. I can go. All right. Um, my name is Neha, and I'm a high school junior, and I'm from Atlanta, and I attend a STEM school in Gwinnett County. That's awesome. Nice to meet you. My name is Abigail Robert, and I am a rising senior at Naperville Christian Academy. 
So yeah, I'm from Naperville, Illinois. It's really great to meet all of you and hear about your passions. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, and um, Samira sent an intro for her for herself, so I'm just going to read it for us. Um, I'm Samira. I go to Fenwick High School, going to become a junior. I live in Garfield Ridge, and I joined FLIP because Corona canceled a lot of things for me, and my alderman found CMAP for me, and at first I didn't know, but now I find it interesting. Nice to meet you, Samira, and nice to meet everybody else. Thank you for introducing yourselves. Um, so before I get started in um, into the discussion, I just wanted to really quickly share um, a, a PowerPoint of, it's, it's a really quick PowerPoint, of just how redlined our cities are. So we have a few folks from Chicago, we have a few folks from Atlanta. Um, and so the first thing that I had wanted to share was this map, which is Atlanta. So. If you all had used the interactive maps um, for the pre-session um, pre material, you would have, this map on the left would have been a familiar one to you. So you can see the key down here below where the red and the yellow colors are the hazardous and definitely declining areas. This map is from the 40s. So you can kind of tell that most of the city center is in these categories. On the right, our current mortgages that are being lent out to people. So I know it's a little bit hard to see because it's small, but the current, but the color coding <clears throat> in each dot represents 10 mortgages that were lent out um, in that region. So the blue dots are mortgages lent out to white families and the yellow dots are mortgages lent out to black families. Um, so you can see that there's a lot of disparity. Um, even currently, this is a really current map, um, you can see a lot of disparity within the Atlanta region. Um, so I wanted to just throw it, throw it out to anyone who's able to see this map right now. Um, what kind of connections can you draw between the past map of Atlanta as, um, and with the current map of Atlanta? Anyone can jump in. And if someone needs clarification, please let me know. Maybe you can provide us with one example, Beatrix. Yeah, sure, no problem. So um, let's go ahead and take these areas up north here. So these areas um, are considered best or still desirable because they're green and blue. Um, so when I look at this map that had been in the past, and then I look at this map in the future, I see that there are a lot of white families up north here because of the predominance of the blue dots. So I can see that, okay, historically on the left map, the northern regions have been given to um, a lot of white families because they're seen as desirable or best areas to live in. And so that legacy has carried over to, um, to the right map where most of the mortgages being lent out are to white families who are still there in the north. Does that make sense? If it does, give me a nod. Okay, cool. Um, maybe we can just practice with the Chicago map. So the Chicago map is pretty similar to the Atlanta map. Um, the red and the yellow regions are still less desirable compared to the blue and green regions. And then on the right side, you can see the um, where lending occurs. So white neighborhoods are colored red on the right map, and the blue dots represent the mortgage, the amount of money that are being lent in those neighborhoods. The bigger the dot, the more money. Um, so taking from what we learned about the last map in Atlanta, how could we read these two maps in Chicago? How could we compare these two maps? I can give an example just to get us started, but All right, go ahead, just, just like Beatrix said, look at how big these circles are on the north side of Chicago, like they're huge. That's a lot of money being given for homes. And then take a look at the south side, which is that blue portion right there, and look how small they are. You know, 
And that's that that represents black communities that represents Latino communities. So think about, um, you know, the disparities in who's receiving money for homes, mortgage lending for homes versus, you know, other communities. Yeah, you that's a, yeah, that's that's a great point, Courtney. Um, does anyone else want to um, jump in, maybe point out where your neighborhood is in either Chicago or Atlanta and then talk about that? can talk about that all right thanks Erin what I think is interesting is that so I live in Wicker Park right now which on this map is one of the redlined areas mm -hmm. but today is a predominantly white community um, so I just have always thought it was interesting looking at the maps um, just like how it's kind of shifted as the middle of the city has become more desirable to live in again and how folks were just displaced from their neighborhoods that they as we can see had been living in for I don't know like at the time of the shift like 70 years so yeah. I've always found that interesting yeah that is interesting do you think the area is becoming possibly gentrified because of that or what do you what do you like? What do you, I guess, like witness when living in Wicker Park? If that makes sense. Yeah. So Wicker Park is um, turn my camera on. Wicker Park is really gentrified. Um, there are a lot of developments that have gone in, especially the for folks who are from the Chicagoland region. The 606 Trail. Um, so when amenities got put into the neighborhood, a lot of people like bought houses that were owned by families that had lived here and turned them into apartments. Um, and it, I don't know, just living in Wicker Park, I was one of the people who said that my neighborhood wasn't missing anything because a lot of the services had followed the people that moved in, uh, which wasn't, that's not how it should have been, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. Thanks for sharing that, Erin, that's great. Okay, does anyone else want to comment on either the Atlanta map or the Chicago map? Anything else you want to say? Okay, we can move on. Um, so, with the remainder of our time, I was hoping that we could talk more about the, um, the overall impression that you all have taken from the session, whether it's whatever something, it's something that Tanika had said or whether that's whatever something the panel had said. Um, so the first question is to everyone, um, what surprised you most about what you learned today? And since most of the CMAP staff have spoken, I'm hoping that Abigail, Sneha, um, Samir, or Christina can jump in um, with some of the observations or something that surprised you through the session today. Go. So it was, um, just one fact that really surprised me was uh, Tanika was saying how her school had even amount of people of all races. I thought that was interesting because they don't do that anymore. But and they don't do that because of like discrimination about oh you're black. But I think it's a little bit worse now because of like the privileges that like white people or people who are much more wealthy have and it's like disproportionate so I find that interesting how they got rid of that law but but having even amounts of people can still give people opportunities that aren't like available now. Yeah that's a great point it's incredible to see like how much change from when Tanika went to school to now like how much change in racial makeup um, we can see in schools. Now, can I ask um, what you think your racial makeup is at your school? Um, so because of the school I go to, it's a little bit different than how most schools go to because you have to apply to get in and it's just like a lottery, so it's random. But you do have to be in a little bit higher classes if, on your previous school, so like in middle school. So it's random, so you don't really have to take the test. So like going into my school, 
compared to the school I would have gone to. I would say there's a lot more Asians and um, there's a lot more black people than it is on my school. So I'd say it is pretty diverse. And like you would expect for the school I go to, which is STEM and has a decent amount of resources, there'd be more white people. But because of how you can get in, it's kind of even in a sense. So there's more Latino and black people than you would initially expect. Uh, thanks for sharing. And I do want to acknowledge that Samira did post in the chat when we were talking about the maps before, just to backtrack a little bit. Um, she was uh, she drew a commonalities between both the Atlanta and Chicago maps, saying that there are more Black people um, in the historically hazardous areas, which is um, which is historically the it's common across many cities in America. So that was a great connection. Thanks, Samira, for that. Um, does anybody else want to comment on one thing they found, one or two things, or however many things that they found surprising about this session? Um, I guess for me personally, um, I knew what redlining was before, but I guess I didn't have as deep of an understanding as I do now. So overall like with the pre-lecture materials and then after viewing the um presenters it was really eye-opening to see how although i guess you could say redlining was established back in like the 18 1900s um, a lot of the rules and sort of barriers that they set out are still like present today and have still i mean are still causing um barriers for people to be able to either go up in economic status or um, just like change their life around, if that makes sense, like from what their ancestors went through. Yeah, definitely, that that does make a lot of sense. Um, what, um, what had been your knowledge of redlining before? Was it like a broad overview of what that term meant? Mm -hmm. So it. before I just knew that like certain areas in each state would be given more funding um, but I guess I just never really either paid attention or researched myself to see like how those lines were drawn and what effects were still present today because of it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. I think it's easy to take for granted what our cities look like. So thanks for sharing that, Christina. Um, I also want to read what Samira wrote. I learned how different people live in better neighborhoods just because of their race and they get more money also, which is not fair. And that's completely right. It is not fair. Um, yeah, you should not, like, no one should ever have to worry, am I going to get this amount of money just because of where I live or or, or our skin color? So totally valid. Um, Abigail, is there anything that you wanted to add about what you thought was interesting? I thought that Tanika's project was brilliant. I've never heard of it before until today, but I thought it was amazing just how it started out as an artistic project, but then in the end, she was connecting people together that were very different but them being able to meet each other and talk to each other was really cool and it's really cool that project became what she has now and yes yeah, so I thought that was really interesting and similar to Christina I've heard about redlining before and I know what it is and it just yeah it still amazes me that it's such a big issue today how the the racial wealth gap has grown and it's really disappointing to me. And as a 17 year old, I, I, I want to play a role in minimizing that. And I just want, I, I really just want to know how, like what's the easiest way to combat this issue. And I, I, before I go back to the, the main room or the breakout rooms end. Can you guys just give me like what are city planning city planners in Chicago doing now to combat this issue? Yeah, definitely. So one of the key things that we're really looking at in CMAP is what we're calling inclusive growth. So we're really focusing on not just growing areas that already have the resources to grow, but really targeting areas as well, like other areas, especially low income marginalized historically. Um, frankly, historically abused areas, reaching out to them and providing them with, here are some, like, what do you want to see in your neighborhood? How can we help you? How can we 
make sure that you're going in the path that you have decided for yourselves and just providing that assistance. So planning is a really slow process, but we'd love to talk more. I mean, you have our contact info. Feel free to reach out. We're almost ending.